Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to USTA Florida's Here to Serve podcast. My name is Laura Bowen, and I'm the executive director here at USTA Florida. And March is Women's History Month. We have plenty to celebrate this month and plenty of women in our state and outside of our state who are working every day to advance gender equity in tennis and in the sports world. Earlier this month, we traveled to uh, the city of Palmetto Bay to Coral Reef Park where we honored three incredible women who are leading in this space. We also released new research showcasing where we can make progress in advancing gender equity in our sport and what we can do better as USTA Florida as we expand our Women in Tennis initiative. Today, I'm pleased to welcome two incredible women to the podcast who have been doing much work in the field of gender equity and coaching. Both Sarah McQuaid and Linda Lowe come to us from ETC Coaching Consultants. Sarah is the owner and founding director of the firm, which was first established in 2005. Prior to starting her own firm, Sarah actually was the education and training manager for Sports Coach UK, and she led the technical development of the UK coaching certificate. Sarah is a pioneer in the field of coach development, and her clientele includes the Commonwealth Games Foundation, UK Coaching, the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USA Football, TB12, and the USTA. Linda Lowe has been a senior consultant for ETC Coaching Consultants uh, for quite some time. She has also been awarded uh, the prestigious title of UK Coach Developer, and she was the National Coach Education Program Manager for Sport Scotland and the National Coaching Program Manager for the Rugby Football League. Linda is now based in Arizona, where she is an international consultant leading women in coaching and leadership initiatives for both the PTR and the Olympic Solidarity Funded Women in Sports High Performance Pathway. These two women have been incredible leaders when it comes to guiding our efforts on gender equity, and I've had the great pleasure to work with them at several PTR workshops. I hope you enjoy this podcast where we dig deeper into what's causing gender inequity in our sport and how we all can work together to make things more equitable going forward. For more information on USTA Florida's Women in Tennis Initiative, and to learn how you can get involved, visit USTAflorida.com slash women in tennis. Right, well, thank you, Sarah and Linda, for joining me for today's episode of the Here to Serve podcast. And first, let me say, happy Women's History Month. It's happy wonderful. Month. Yes, it's wonderful. It's March. We have two amazing women and i thought that maybe we could start by asking each of you to share one woman in history that you look up to and maybe say a little bit about why it's important for us to celebrate women's history each year do you know it's a lovely question and when push comes to shove it's really difficult to identify just one woman. So the temptation is to kind of go into the history books and, you know, sort of go decades and centuries back. But I I really thought long and hard about the answer to the question and my head kept turning back to one of my, one of our dearest friends and colleagues, uh, a woman called Penny Crisfield. So she is based in the UK and I describe her as the, as the godmother of coach education. So I was lucky enough about 25 years ago to work with her and really learn about coaching, about coach development. I had the opportunity to learn about the infrastructure that's required to help educate and develop coaches. And what she taught me was that actually the role of the coach developer in terms of quality coaching and quality athlete experiences is critical. And I 
I, I keep saying I, but it's it's very genuinely a we. But we got the opportunity to really hang on to her coattails for years and just watch and learn and absorb huge amounts of phenomenal practices. Um, so much so that when I, I came into post at the US Tennis Association, I was able to create the Coach Developer Academy, which really was founded by so much of the early work she'd done and my early formative experiences in in coaching. So it, it's Penny Grisfield and she'd be mortified if she knew I was talking about Well, she's going to know now. If she's <laughs> listening, we'll have to make sure Penny gets the podcast because I love the idea that a woman in history, that, that was history I didn't know, actually led you two to be amazing women in history as well. So, Linda, anything you want to add? Is there another woman that you want to talk about? Absolutely. And, I mean, Sarah and I are very fortunate to have had that opportunity together to work with Penny, but also very fortunate that there were other women leaders that inspired us. And I'm going now from coach education to women's leadership in sport. And Pauline Harrison, Lucy Faulkner, and Elizabeth Pike, all jointly, so I have to name them all, um, started the first Women's Sport Leadership Academy for women sports leaders globally to come together to learn. And I was really fortunate to be a participant in that first programme, which really raised my awareness of so many issues and took me on that journey to become a facilitator on the programme and now consequently lead on women's sports leadership's programmes because of them. And they really are inspirational women in terms of really seeing an opportunity for women across sports and across countries to work together, to form a network and to really begin to make a difference and lead the change. Awesome. Do either of you want to say anything about why it's important that we celebrate Women's History Month? I mean, I think that I could probably talk for 45 minutes on that myself. Uh, what you just shared with me is part of the reason, right? Things I didn't know about incredible women. But do either of you have thoughts on why it's so critical for us to celebrate during the month of March? And if I start and say that, you know, it's about role models, you know, and we can't be on our tennis podcast without not mentioning Billie Jean King as well. I mean, probably one of the most well-known role models, not just in tennis, not just in sport, but globally and within society in general. And we need to have those people and celebrate them as role models so that we can inspire other women. It really is a part of everything that we do. Laura, I see you as a great leader doing that all of the time, is showing that as a woman you can lead and you can lead with your own style of leadership. Um, and I think that's essential and I love that we're doing more and more of it. I love that you said that own style of leadership. I'm watching the Althea Gibson documentary right now. I'm almost at the end. And things that I didn't know about Althea is her style was very unique. It was not for everyone, but she was such an authentic human being. And one of the things that inspired me watching that was how true to herself and her authenticity that she was, even when people, you know, maybe discouraged her from being who she really was. So all of these things come out during Women's History Month, and I'm so glad, Linda, that you you said that. Sarah, why do you think it's important to you that we celebrate Women's History Month? You know, it's a lovely question, and my my simple answer is one of gratitude. I think it's really important to acknowledge the roles that some of these women, all of these women have played, and be grateful for these women that preceded us and were brave enough and fearless enough to to really change the status quo. So for me, it's it's about gratitude and it's about legacy building. Awesome, awesome answers. So I want to turn to coaching for a minute. You are both coaches and you both happen to be from the UK. Um, I think our audience probably picked up on that even if they're not watching this podcast. Um, could you share a little bit about the landscape for women in coaching worldwide and how your experiences as a woman coach have led you to the work you do today with 
PTR and with other organizations uh, in tennis and in sport. Yeah, and I think it's it's really important to to think about the story, to think about why we end up in the, the roles that we do. And a little bit about my journey was I, I started as a track and field coach um, and really enjoyed coaching in that track and field environment and moved on to uh, become national lead for Scottish athletics and then into the role of coach development and that real interest in terms of coaching styles and how to help coaches become more effective. <clears throat> but then you think, what else? What else within there? And that led to this leadership work that I mentioned in terms of uh, Pauline, Lucy and Elizabeth. But what raised the awareness? The raised the awareness is some of that biases that you came across some of the things that happened at the time you just accepted because it's just the way that things were and I, I have a little story to share that probably shows why I became so passionate is um I was working with a, a golf organization in Scotland and there was a group of us going to a meeting and uh, we went to walk into the building and this gentleman came out and said, don't know, madam, you can't come in the front door wearing trousers. And it's a very traditional. So I looked and he was directing me towards the side entrance. So the men were allowed to go in the front entrance and I was due to go in the side entrance because it was a woman wearing trousers. So I pulled my trousers down. Huh. <laughs> I suddenly decided that it might be better just to let me in the front door. Ooh, good for you. <laughs> um, yes, those kinds of things that you look back on now, that, that I just did that, walked in the front door, was a little bit grumpy and then got on with the meeting. But it's only by making those stands and by doing those things that, that helps you recognise, just hold on a minute, it's not acceptable behaviour. Yeah. You know, and there are many more moments that I'm sure we can all share that are similar to that, but we, we have to make the change. And those changes are the same across countries. The work that I do on the Women's Sport High Performance Coaching Programme, which is designed to increase the number of women coaching at the Olympics. We've got 122 coaches from 60 different countries and 22 different sports. And the issues are all very similar. You know, and that's the key thing because that can unite us because so many of the issues are similar, we can work together to make that difference. So I think the key message I'm trying to say here is that that there is unconscious bias. There is conscious bias. It's similar regardless of sport or country. And we can work together to change it. And we are. I have a follow-up question, uh, but Sarah, do you want to add a little bit to, uh, my follow-up question is super hard, so I'll just sort of like throw that out there as like, the next question is going to be a hard one. Is there anything you want to ask Sarah before I toss out a harder question? You, 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 you know, I, I, I can't begin to tell you how long I've known Linda, but I have not heard the, the, the trousers the, the story. The trousers story um, is now like going to be my thing when... I think I'm in a meeting and I, somebody sort of displays their bias. I'm going to be like, should I pull my trousers down? Or should I not? That's going to run through my head now. <laughs> you know, it, it's, and I think it, it's sort of all joking and stuff. I mean, reading you talk about some of these sort of institutionalized policies and practice, some of which are relatively archaic and some of which are not. But I was, when I was in the UK, I was fortunate enough to be part of the systems change. And part of the systems change was driven by a framework uh, of equality standards. So at the time, the government uh, used, the, the, the government lead agency for coaching used government funding as a carrot and or a stick to encourage national governing bodies to start to comply with these equality standards, which were really designed to um, attract people from diverse backgrounds with protected characteristics to be able to encourage them to be part of sport at every level. So I was part of the team that shaped the standards, trained the assessment team. I also worked as an equality standards advisor. So what that did for me was to ensure that 
by design rather than accident, there was a very intentional, very thoughtful approach to engaging all sorts of people, especially women. So what I've been able to do since then is to really start to think about the role that women play at every level from sort of shop floor to to top floor. And again, Linda and I have been fortunate enough since we came to the US to work within a broader context. But really the pace we're gaining over the last 24, 24 months or so working with organisations, working with women's development initiatives has been a really lovely opportunity to start to bring that design not accident approach into some some really intentional work here. And, and we haven't had to pull our trousers down once. <laughs> well, I mean, that's progress. I, I'm reminded of there's an interview, I think, with Catherine Hepburn and Barbara Walters, where she talks to her about wearing trousers. And that just came into my mind with your story, Linda, about, you know, we, we could laugh about that. But in, in all truthfulness, such a big issue that is so culturally embedded. And that's just one example. Mm-hmm. So here's my hard question. I'm very curious to see your answer because I know it's a very complicated answer. Why can't we get beyond this 25% benchmark in coaching for how many women we have as coaches? We seem to kind of hover around that mark for years and years and years. It baffles me. I mean, it doesn't baffle me really, but it it stands out to me that we can't get past that mark, but yet we have so many more women playing and working in our sport. My team is full of women. We have women players on the court, yet we seem to bump up against this feeling in coaching that's 25%. Why, why can't we, we seem to break through that? I think the answer is we can. We can and we are. And that's the amazing thing about being involved in sport at this time. As Sarah mentioned, I think the momentum over the last two years has really created that snowball that's beginning to grow. And I really believe that statistic will change and will continue to change more year on year. And and that's because of a huge number of initiatives. You know, even the, the research, we've got much more research. Two years ago, when Sarah and I were trying to find research evidence for the programmes we were running, it, you had to do a lot of digging around to find things. There wasn't much research in terms of women in sport, women in coaching, and women in leadership. But now there's much more. You know, UST, Florida, you have your specific research as well. What that does is it helps us devise initiatives that actually are to do the right things. The right things for the coaches, the players, the officials, the administrators, the leaders, in each of those contexts, in each of those cultures. And that's one of the great things that we can do. And, you know, an example that both Sarah and I work with Milena Vidos at the PTR, And their PTRW program that Milena leads. You know, I love a a part of that, the Because We Can program, Mm -hmm. is three online sessions. The first session, absolutely, is is a set session. After that, we ask the women what they would like, whether it's on-court issues, whether it's off-court issues. What is it that that group of women want to talk about? And we design sessions to meet their needs at that moment in time. And, and, you know, it is about creating them together as a network. It's about sharing in their own successes. And there's so many things that come up time and time again. And it's one of the issues is the confidence piece. It's about being able to present with confidence. And I know that's something that, that you're passionate about and lead programs as well so that women's voices can be heard. So there's lots of things that's happening. Um, and the key thing is as well, if we look at Dr. Nicola Voy's research, she says, you know, less than 24% women are statistical tokens. Well, that 25% isn't much more. Okay, but once we start that change, once we start that snowball, that begins to change. And the reason I'm convinced we'll be so successful is, you know, I've done a lot of research looking at what happened for athletes in the Olympics being an area that's been researched. Paris will be the first time that there's gender equity across the sports, 50% male and female. Well, that's taken a long time, but they've got there. They've got there by initiatives, legislation, they've got there by targets, and they've got there by financing that happening. 
But the interesting piece is when you look at officials, that's closer to 40%. That's between the 30 and 40%. So there's lots of women officiating, but the coaching's down at 13%. And again, it's because that change has been driven from athlete down. So we will, we absolutely will get there. And I think we'll be there by the LA Games. That would, that would be phenomenal. Would love to see that. And I, I should qualify one of the things I've wondered about the coaching statistic is obviously we're getting those from the certification bodies, which doesn't really capture all the women that may be coaching in some capacity out there. You have high school tennis coaches and others that may not be certified coaches. And of course, like there's a, that's a whole separate podcast, but the idea that we're, we also are only capturing a certain segment of the coaching population and it will be really interesting to see you in our community coach program. We have, I think it's more like a 60, 40 split of male, female. It's, it's a much higher demographic of women than it is on the certification side. And there's, there's many questions I have about that too, which sometimes maybe we'll, we'll get to research on that, but thank you for that, for inspiring me to think we're, we're going to make more progress in the future. That's wonderful. And, and I think the other thing to reassure you is that change takes time. You know, I know when I started working with the USDA, we talked about this sort of cultural change within coach education, and we talked about a five to seven year game plan. So change does take time, but also change doesn't necessarily happen because it's sort of dropped on or it's imposed. For me, change happens because it's seeds that are sown locally that support local growth. And when you have local growth and then you have this patchwork of local growth across all of the different areas and all of the different sections, all of a sudden you have this sort of, this huge seed change. And there's a, there's a sort of a swell of change. But what, what we have recognised, and we've spent sort of two years listening to the women who participated in the PTR W programme, and we've, we've heard their voices from an anecdotal perspective, which have reinforced what Dr. Lavoie's work says about some of the issues and some of the solutions. And what we've wanted to do is to really raise awareness and help organisations, or whether these are tennis training providers or sections, raise awareness on a local level so they can drive their own change. And what we created with the PTR was a workshop called because we need change um just does what it says on the tin i guess but really what it what it's allowed us to do is use the evidence base that's been generated to raise awareness and empower organizations to identify and drive needs-led change that addresses regional and organizational issues um so that that's that's something that we're proud of is is enabling organisations to own their own journey moving forward. But uh, the word of caution here is, it's around patience. Well, I'm grateful for that reminder because I am patient with some things, maybe not so much with others. Um, but also the reminder about cultural change, and I'm really glad that you mentioned that. I've been to a lot of sessions that focus on women. There's there's many of them. And the first time that I met the two of you was at a PTRW summit at IMG Academy. And I think it was two or three years ago. And I walked in a little bit late and you had these group discussions. And I, you know, they were just like, oh, pick a table. So I, I picked a table and the table, uh, you have men coaches, male coaches in the room with women in these sessions. And that was really intriguing to me. And my table had all women and one man at it. And so I was there just sort of listening to it. And at some point, the women weren't talking, but the male coach was. And one of you, I think it was you, Sarah, I can't remember if it was you or Linda, came over and just sort of put your hand on his shoulder and said, let them answer the question or let them, you know. And so you walked away same thing happened. They started, you know, well, I don't know about this. And he jumped, jumped in again. And you came back around again and said, let, and he said, well, this frustrates me because women can't ever make a decision. And at that moment, the fact that you had come around twice, I said, I take exception to that. And 
the fact that the way that you did this worship was very different than anything that I had seen is that you were observing the behaviors in the room and you were reinforcing these principles of equity in that discussion time and time again in ways that in my experience were never done. You know, you'd walk out of a room and say, God, that guy just wouldn't stop talking. And nobody would say anything in the room and you get frustrated. And it was really eye-opening for me, the work that you did. And I wanted to ask you, I've been wanting to ask you this question for so long. Can you say more about why having these women-specific opportunities is important but also what both the women and the men in the room can learn and unlearn when they're in these sessions. Uh, uh, And what a great question. And I think, you know, by listening uh, to that story there, you can see why women only opportunities are essential. Uh, Yeah, I was one of the skeptics at first um, because we do work in society where there are men. But, But what it does is it creates a space and an environment where women can examine their own coaching and leadership styles, what it means to them and how they want to coach and lead, not follow the traditional models. But, you know, we've mentioned authentic leadership already, but we want to be able to do that with time and with space and and, and with support. Uh, And then once we know who we are, who we are as leaders, who we are as coaches, not who society expects us to be, then there's the chance to move forward, to develop the skills as leaders, to be able to articulate that really clearly, to stand up for what we believe in, and then move into environments where we have the male allies that support us. And the real example in that situation was those were the male allies in the room and they still couldn't stop and let the women's voices be heard. And it's often, it's a two-way, remember, and the Because We Need Change workshop, the similar thing happened. And we raised the men's awareness of the fact that they had this desire to contribute and to help was with the greatest intent. But also as women, we had the desire not to have our voices heard. We let them talk, even when they were the only man on the table, if we were feeding back. And then we just raise awareness and we say, and the rule thou is that one of the women has to talk back. You have to practice the skill of being heard and being confident because it's your story. So those are the things that we begin to do to bring this to life. It's so powerful to me because when I said that, the other thing I said to him is I take exception to that because I'm a very decisive woman and I also get criticized for that. And at that point, he stopped talking. And I think that was sort of, you know, the the moment where, like you said, you know, we have to own this space that we're in right now and not let someone else determine what the right behavior or discussion or tone is. And again, I, I had never been in a session that I felt that it was okay to sort of have that that type of exchange. So thank you. I I just want to say thank you on this podcast and thank you publicly for facilitating that because that's truly what you do is you facilitate those things that do lead to changing behaviors of all of us and to make it more equitable. So thank you. That's all. That's all all I can say there, Sarah. I don't know if you have anything to add. Uh, I mean, you all do a lot of these sessions. So I would love to hear your thoughts on kind of how you've seen the equity kind of flow through those rooms. You know, and again, it, it's interesting, and Linda and I were, were chatting about this earlier, and there is absolutely a a time and place for women-only events. There's a time and place to create a psychologically safe space to allow women to network, to share, to explore, to empathise, to learn, to develop. You know, and much of that is around the skills building and some of the, and these genuinely are some of the skills that we're on a daily basis accused of lacking. Women can't make a decision. Women aren't brave enough to step forward. Women aren't confident enough. So genuinely some of these sessions are designed to do exactly that, which is the safe space to explore and, and develop some of those critical skills. 
But also there is a time and place to operate an open door policy. And that's really when you start to think about the work we're doing with Because We Need Change. These are these workshops have a different intent. They're around awareness raising, they're around development planning, they're they're very solution focused. And actually much of those events are designed to open eyes and minds to new possibilities about the opportunities that women bring. Women are not problems to be solved, they're opportunities to be embraced. And for me, that open door policy of those moments in time is critical. I love that you said that and that you pointed to the skills that women bring to the table. I actually did a little search recently on the top, the the jobs or careers that have the most percentage of women. And a lot of times women are told we don't have business skills, we need to be developed, you know, financially, which I find laughable because women have been managing the finances of a home for like ever, right? Um, and they make a lot of the buying decisions in in homes. But that that trope comes up a lot. And accounting was one of those fields that has, you know, a high percentage of women in it. And so as I was looking down the list, I thought to myself, you know, a lot of these biases that we have the data doesn't support it. Women excel in a number of different fields that require a wide range of skills, knowledge, skills, and abilities. And so I love that you said we're not a problem to be solved. You know, I don't need, you know, training in things that maybe I already bring to the table. And we make a lot of assumptions that I love that you sort of, you know, clear the air there a little bit and say, oh, I think maybe we're thinking of this a little bit wrong. Love it. I want to turn to leadership for a minute because that's another skill that we often are. You said it earlier, you know, maybe women aren't leaders. They don't know how to, you know, make decisions or take up space in a room. People sometimes feel that. And one of the most interesting findings that um, I took away from our research was that many of the same challenges that women experience in the coaching world, they also apply to leadership. Like they're kind of two sides of the, the same coin. And I know from my own experience uh, in this organization, but in others, that the women I work with are almost always less likely to tout themselves, to say what, you know, what they do, how great they are, how much they know. They oftentimes won't apply for jobs unless they're absolutely certain they can do it. I, I have a lot of those conversations where I'm like, you can do this job. You're so smart and capable. Um, and we already talked about being less likely to speak up in a room. What can we do to empower women in all of these ways? And how do we get more young girls to develop and embrace these behaviors from a much younger age? It's, it is the challenge, isn't it? And it's about recognizing there's a, there are a number of approaches we need to take. So if we look at, first of all, women not applying for positions, you know, that, that system for job application was designed by men for men. You know, this belief that just because I've advertised the post, then the women will apply. Well, that's not the way we currently work. If there's something that we can't do within that job description, we're less likely to apply. And the research tells us, as you mentioned, the men will apply. So rather than change that application process, they expect us to change. So yes, absolutely, to be the people that can lead the change, to have more of the leadership role so that we can make that change, some of us will have to adapt, will have to be uncomfortable, will have to step forward. And by building confidence and encouraging other women and by having those role models, more women will. But that's about us changing changing in our nature and having that confidence to step forward in that unsure way. But the system can change too. What is to say that those things that are in the essential aspects of a job criteria, maybe we put them in desirable so more women might apply. I don't have it, but it's only desirable. So yes, maybe I could. What is it about the conversations that we could have with women to say, I can't promise the job, but I really think you should apply because you're an excellent candidate. If we really truly want women to be within the system and be there leading the change, we need to make the changes by changing who we are as women to fit into that change 
but also that system beginning to change and recognising it was designed by men for men. It wasn't a deliberate ploy, it was the way that it happened. But recognising that and realising that there's a difference between equity and equality and really making specific inroads into how to make those changes. And they are starting. They absolutely are starting. That's awesome. And I see the same thing with women speakers at conferences. There's this assumption if you do a major call out for women, for speakers that women will just show up. And I've had that conversation so many times where I'm like, did you pick up the phone and call women you knew and said, I think you would be a great presenter and here's why. And 99% of the time it was like, no, why should I have to do that? And I'm like, do you want more women to speak? Because mm-hmm. that's what you have to do because we operate differently. Change the system and your approach and you might have a better result. And oh, by the way, have a woman call them and you might get an even better response. So it's pretty funny to see it kind of, it translates to a lot of things. And also, once I picked up the phone and made the call, what support am I providing to encourage these women to believe that they can present, talk, lead? Because inevitably, there's there's a little bit of persuasion that may well have to be done to remind these women that they absolutely are capable of sharing phenomenal stories in great big rooms full of intimidating people. But that's that's the pieces. What are these programs and initiatives that we're putting in place that these enable these women to shift from a philosophically, oh, I'm not sure I can do that, to a, you know what, I believe I can. And I think there are so many development initiatives, whether these are athlete development initiatives, coach development initiatives, or leadership development initiatives. And many of these initiatives have some very common themes that run throughout. And many of them start with a identifiable reference points that people can relate to so that they can see themselves in and amongst these landscape of behaviours that they don't believe they've quite got. But also these programmes will provide mentoring and dedicated support to enable, whether these are athletes, coaches, coach developers or leaders, to create a really thoughtful professional development plan that's designed to help them identify where they are now and chart and move towards where they want to be. So the journey support is really key. And again, these development initiatives don't have to be led by Olympic federations or international governing bodies. These can be led at any level. And I think leaning on some of the development initiatives that are there would be ever so helpful to grow those seeds of change that we talked about being so locally. And just picking up on that as well is that, you know, we do approach it from both sides. I think that's the essential. It is about creating a network of women who believe in themselves Mm. and support each other. But it's also about changing the systems to enable women to operate at the levels they want to operate at. When you look in coaching in particular, you know, there are more women with identified in the more development roles within coaching, but why are there less women higher up in those roles? And Michelle de Heijen at the Australian Institute of Sport has done quite a lot of research in this area as well. And and it really is, it's it's about values. So Mm. when we look at values that women are not willing to compromise on family is one of those you know why should you if you're the head coach not be able to attend your child's birthday party or your parents anniversary or whichever other significant family events there are because we believe that head coach role is so important that they have to be there all of the time every single competition at every single training event but why don't we create roles that enable people to offer what they can offer to that high extent? Why don't we have job shares? Yeah. Why don't we have more opportunities to say, we would like you to be the coach on campus or at the facility, but we'll have another coach that goes traveling. Or you'll travel some of the time. Those systems are easy to do and you'd probably get even more by having more people involved in supporting the development of the players. So it's looking at innovative ways to enable women to give the tremendous skills that they have for the time that they've got available. 
and capitalize on that time rather than to say, no, you can't, yeah. because you can't commit to all of it. And I think we will begin to see more of that change. I'm very excited. Well, and I, this is a topic we could probably do a whole separate podcast on. I, I did have a question on this one, which is sort of about the idea of balancing family and work. And one of the things I noticed here, even in my own organization, is the default answer is always women with children. And one of the things that is really difficult for me is that while that is true and we do need to provide support there, it continues to put women in this one singular box of you are a mother first and these things after. We know women are caregivers in many other ways. There are women that care for parents. There are are many other things and identities that we have. And I'll just tell you a really quick story. I have many women on my staff. I also have men on my staff and I have women who pick up their kids from school and, and, you know, they work flexible schedules and everybody just sort of is like, Oh, that's normal. I have a male on my staff who actually does that. And I will tell you that more than one occasion, somebody has complained and I say to them, why is it different? This is a single male parent that is a single parent who's obligated to go pick up their children. It should be the same. So sometimes equity works for us and sometimes it, you know, doesn't work for others. But I'm very, very adamant here of that if there was a greater balance in the caregiving role across the board, and if we had policies that supported broader caregiving scope, because as you say, as women, maybe that's something I value is to be a caregiver, even though I don't have children. Those are the things that I think aren't often thought about. And there are process and systemic weaknesses like the planning ahead of meetings and events. You know, the idea that we have the same flexibility or everybody has the same flexibility. This one goes so deep for me in all the conversations I've had with my women executives that I work with that women say, yes, the caregiving as a mother is super important, but also there are other things embedded in the culture that are also preventing us. So you can give me maternity leave, but there are many other places in my life where I'm going to need flexibility. And this one thing isn't enough for me. And I've really seen that play out in so many ways with the women that I've worked with and the women on my team. And also as the example I gave, even with the men on my team, of experiencing that sort of unconscious bias of you shouldn't have to do these things because you're a man and you're not a woman. So I find it very fascinating. I'm curious in terms of the culture overall and some of those biases, is there any other ways that you see as an industry that we can maybe address them or open up to a broader conversation about those gender roles and the flexibility needed? I think it it leads to really in the discussions, and I'm going to go back to this this leadership piece, is when women have the opportunity to think about the values that underpin leadership, then often you hear very different things. Now, that doesn't mean that women can't be decisive leaders. It doesn't mean that they're not strong leaders. Um, it means that given time and space, often there are other things that become much more important. So... You know, one of the the women's groups that I work on, we spent some time really thinking about this and why it's so important. And and values are absolutely key to the leadership piece that then leads into the types of conversations you're talking about, which is creating a better environment for all, not just for women. You know, so when we listen to some of these values, and these are the values that came from the WISH program. So the first value that we thought of was caring. Caring about the interests of each person and their individual circumstances. So we defined what caring meant. It was about the individual. Well, that applies across. It was altruistic. It was, this is about creating an environment where we support everyone within that environment and those outside it. This was a women's initiative about supporting women. Passionate about our belief in gender equity. Another value that we have to live inclusive of diversity, empowering to develop strength and confidence, collaborative about working together, 
and then randomness. And what that meant was that playful creativity that helped create fun and learning and brought the network together. Now, those are the types of values that if we move across all of the environments that they work, that we work in, that people work in, we'll, we'll create equity. And that doesn't just mean for women, although more often we're disadvantaged. It's about creating those opportunities where the individual is valued for the strengths that they have, but also recognise that, that work is part of their life, not their whole life. And if you have those values, you have to believe it and le- live it as a person all of the time, not just as a leader mm-hmm. or a coach. That's so good. And I think the other piece for me is, you know, when you start to think about the different tiers across which some of our issues are scaffolded, they're societal, they're organisational, they're interpersonal, they're individual. And we know this from the word that, Dr. Lavoie's done. But if we think about values, and I'm, and these are really well articulated values, and Linda's just given us a lovely example there, but values can serve as a moral compass. They can also serve as decision making reference points. And genuinely, much of the change or much of the decisions are made at an individual and an interpersonal level. So if an organization can trust, that people in positions of responsibility, whether that's leadership responsibilities or project-based responsibilities, can act with integrity, then trust them to act with integrity. And I know while I was at the USDA, um, I had two two chaps on my team that I was responsible for. And one of our values was family first. And that was our moral compass. And we we absolutely understood that this was really important. And if either of them needed to prioritise the family, there was that implicit trust that, yes, I'm stealing time now, but you'll get it back. I'm going to bring it back, whether it's yeah. this evening or on the weekend. So I think trust at the base and empowering people to make really good decisions, I think, gives any individual room to be, breathe and act responsibly rather than creating what in essence is a work to rule ethos. And, you know, that's something that I think is so important to share in all of these sessions that, you know, we can put out best practices and we can say these are sort of some guiding principles, but so many times in organizations and in leadership, it is your values, your leadership values, what you believe in, what you bring to the table that really define, especially those difficult decisions to say, you know, how do I lead the team? What changes can I drive or should I drive that are going to create a more equitable space? And I think that's been a great learning lesson for me, particularly over the last four to five years. And I love that you both sort of have that as foundational and also the research obviously bears that out. Um, for anyone listening to the pod that hasn't looked at any of these research reports, I can mm. tell you it is worth the time, energy, and effort. Uh, we That's one of the reasons we did our research was to compile them because there were so many mm. things out there. It's like, let's kind of get our arms around this, but there's so much more out there. And, and you know, that was one of the things the researchers say is that, you know, these things are, it's not a mystery. They're out there. The information is out there. My last question for the two of you, I know we're running short on time, is that um, the research I mentioned on our Women in Tennis initiative, one of the things we wanted them to do was analyze our work and say, how does our work live up to the standards we're trying to achieve? And they, one of the things they came back with is said, you know, we have to be clearer about the purpose of our initiatives and secondly, embed that equity work in all of our coach education. So it wasn't just putting these women's events on and talking about equity there. It was really embedding it across the board. In your view, how do we get our entire industry maybe to embrace this gender equity work and set some very clear common goals for the future? Is that even possible for us to do? You know, it's it's a really interesting question, and I think this comes back to seed change. 
or change. So, so can it be imposed or is it grown from the ground up? And I, you know, it's interesting. We look at Dr. Lavoie's report, which was commissioned by the USTA. It paints a picture of what's happening currently within and across the tennis ecosystem. And, you know, let's be honest, it's not a terribly flattering report, but it's unbelievably honest. And it does give us a starting point to drive the change that we need to create. The work that Clarity have done with you and the work that you've done with them, with Candice and Asher, support your efforts to actually understand what's the picture that's being painted in Florida. So actually what you're able to generate are some really thoughtful answers to some of the questions that have been flagged by the research. And again, you you really should be congratulated for what you've done in Florida with your women in tennis initiatives. And, you know, this was something, this was one of the key drivers for us to build this Because We Need Change workshop. Because when you don't know what you don't know, how do you know what you need to do to drive the change that you don't actually know that you yet need to create? So it's all horribly confusing, but again... I think there is a responsibility, whether that's at a national level, at a section level, at an organisational level, whether this is the responsibility of the teaching orgs, but helping raise that awareness so that actually some of these purpose-driven initiatives are driven on a needs-led basis by what individual organisations, regions and geographies need. So for me, it's this locally grown seed to create a a landscape of change. And just, you know, looking at how, how does that happen? You know, and it is about building relationships. It's about building the relationships with the male advocates we have as well. It's about building relationships with the women in this space and creating the networks that support one another because we know men have better professional networks. And it's about deliberately designing activities to create that network so that women feel more confident and empowered to build those relationships and create a climate where everyone can succeed and change can happen. Because we need male allies. We're not in the positions of power in society or in many of the environments at which women are operating. And we've got more men who are willing to help and they just don't know how to. And we don't know how to speak up to help them help us. So it's about creating opportunities for those conversations to take place. And and that's the key thing is everyone is so busy driving performance that we haven't invested the time and actually building those relationships, having clarity in terms of what we can do and how we can do it together before we jump. So let's do that. Let's make that change because we can. The time is right. The opportunities are there. And um, I think women feel more empowered than we ever have to start driving that change. That's so well said. Um, To echo that, I think women in sports particularly right now are having a watershed moment you see what's Mm -hmm. happening in basketball um the nfl i I think it's finally come to light that that some of those myths about you know women don't want sports they don't drive viewership they don't drive marketing all of those things are sort of somewhat tumbling down right now which is a wonderful moment for us to see so I love hearing you say that this is the time for us to get together and us to really drive that change. And so hopefully to all of those who are listening to the podcast, men, women, whether you're in tennis, not in tennis, you know, the more people and the more energy we can get together to kind of build the future of our sport, the better we'll all be. And you two are just uh, pillars of that. And I'm so very grateful for you spending so much time with me today. Thank you for the work you do. And I know that I'll see you again at a, another meeting, another conference. I always learn from you and you, you always have a home here in sunny Florida anytime you wish to come. Yay! <laughs> so thank you again for being on the podcast. 
And thank, thank you. you, thank you very much, Laura, and thank you for all that you do. I can certainly say that we feel really confident that you will drive that change to support not just the women in tennis in Florida, but influence uh, tennis and the wider sporting agenda with all you do. So thank you. Thank you very much. That's all for this episode of USDA Florida's Here to Serve podcast. I hope you enjoyed the topic. Please check our social media channels for more ways to engage with USDA Florida during our 75th anniversary year. And for more upcoming topics, dates, and episodes of the pod, visit USTAFlorida.com slash here to serve.